little vignette into the history of agent-based modeling, we're going to talk about particle systems and computer graphics. So early on in computer graphics, uh, visualizations were essentially accomplished by creating large flat surfaces and then combining them in ways to create what was a computer graphic, right? And to this day, a lot of computer graphics is still done that way. Like you place textures on these polygons and you, you place them in different places. But, there, but there's another way uh, to do graphics, which is to think of graphics not as a as a polygon that's moving through space, but just as a point. And maybe you give that point some sort of size, right? Um, and but you're but you're essentially manipulating now the center of that point rather than manipulating all four corners of a, of a square or a three or a triangle or whatever, right? Um, and in fact, surfaces don't work very well for things like smokes, uh, smoke, stars, uh, lights, or even birds for that matter. And so instead, you need some sort of point representation, as we talked about, right? Uh, and this point representation of graphics came to be known as particle systems. And what's interesting is that once you think of these things as a point, well, a lot of our physics models are actually written as points, right? As, as idealized point models, right? And so then you can apply those physics models to computer graphics in a very easy and intuitive way, uh, and you can create interesting displays of computer graphics, right? So how does this relate to ABM? Well, particle systems also exhibit emergent phenomena. So for instance, if I have, if I'm, if I'm representing a bunch of red particles as a fire, as they kind of overlap, depending upon how I've done the transparencies, right, they appear denser or lighter. And so I can get this like flickering flame type of effect that looks very similar to um, uh, a, a fire, right? Well, that's an emergent phenomenon that happens as a result of all those particles interacting. If you just had one, it wouldn't look like a flame, right? Um, and so they exhibit the same kind of emergent behavior in some respects that agent based models. They also exhibit agent interaction, right? In that sense that when those particles come together, they are exhibiting, they are doing things similarly to the way agents or objects might interact, right? And in fact, based upon this, it was really particle systems, among other things, that inspired Craig Reynolds to develop the Boyd's model, which we talked about way back in unit one, right? Uh, and the three simple rules that create the flocking patterns, right? And in fact, as we look at the particle system models, a lot of them contain very simple rules that describe how the particles interact. What's also interesting was there was the Boyd's model that in many ways led or helped inspire Chris Langton and others to start thinking about artificial life, right? So shortly after Reynolds, who's pictured here, presented uh, the Boyd's model at SIGGRAPH 87, uh, Chris really organized the first uh, workshop on artificial life, right? Um, and artificial life has a lot of relationships to ABM because it really has this goal of creating life-like behavior inside of a computer, right? And usually we mean biological life in that context, but you know, it, it, it's an interesting uh, uh, look at things. And that draws on things like the Boyd's model, it draws on settler automata theory, it draws on uh, genetic algorithms and many other things. So in many ways, the particle systems, right, helped us to think about agent-based models through the venue of voids, through the venue of artificial life, and had a big influence on some of the early agent-based modeling that was being developed. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the particle systems models now, right? Uh, and these are in uh, the computer science uh, section in the models library under particle systems. And I want to talk about the waterfall one. If you ever have trouble finding them, remember, you can always just type in, you can type in particle system. And that will get all the particle systems you want. Just find the waterfall one. You can type in waterfall, right? Uh, regardless, we'll go ahead and open it, right? And, you know, as always, let's just kind of take a look at it first, right? And it kind of is supposed to look like this waterfall, right? We got these blue dots that are coming down from above, and they're kind of streaming out, and they're overlapping. And one thing to note right away is that in particle systems, there is no direct interaction. The particles are imagined as almost as if they have no mass. No, sorry, they do have mass. They have no, no physical occupation of a space, right? They can't interfere with each other. And so the only way they're really interacting is by overlapping with each other, right? And so by overlapping with each other, they give the, they give the look of having some sort of continuous streaming effect, right? Um, and... Uh, but they but they do have different properties, right? So they have different masses, and if you'll notice, right, the the smaller ones tend to fly farther out uh, in the waterfall, and the bigger ones tend to stay closer to it. 
Um, the smaller ones uh, will often bounce a little higher too as well, and the bigger ones kind of, you know, there's different aspects to how they interact, right? Um, and uh, in the model, what you get to control is the properties of the initial particles. So you can control their initial x velocity, for instance, and that's going to make them shoot farther away from this origin point over here, right? Um, you can even make them go up in the air a little bit, right? And so now they're shooting up a little bit before they come down. Now they're actually shooting too far off the screen, so no one's showing up, right? Um, and uh, you can even do things like play around with gravity, right? So you can, you know, make gravity stronger, you can make gravity weaker, and that will cause, you know, the, the, the waterfall to look a little bit different for each other. And we could do things like increase the wind, right? So the wind, the reason why they're, they're streaming off in that direction at all right now is because there's a wind pushing them that way, right? If we take the wind away, right, they all start to fall straight down uh, oh, once their initial velocity is lowered as well, right? Oh, sorry, too far, I think. Nope, we need a little bit of wind to get them to show up. Yeah, there they are. Oh, oh, I see what happened. Actually, what happened was that when you have too little wind and too little thing, the particles don't move off the edge of the space. And the next property I want to talk about was the max number of particles. So this is just a way to kind of constrain so you don't create too many agents and constrain the computational power. Um, so what would happen was that we had so many particles just sitting dead at the bottom that we were hitting our max number of particles limit. And so it wasn't creating any new ones to come out of here, right? Um, so let's see, and you, and you can even make the wind go up and down as well, right? Um, so just let's try and get back to someplace closer to where we were, right? Okay, here we go. So now we've got a, a more standard result, right? Anyways, let's look at what the code actually does now that we've played around with the model a little bit. So if we go down to the go procedure, the go procedure is just creating particles as need be, right? The new particles coming in computing the forces and applying the forces. And if you look at compute forces, it's basically just applying gravity, wind, and viscosity, right? Um, and then it's applying those by actually moving the particle, right? Changing the velocity x and the velocity y such that it moves the particle that little bit, right? Uh, so let's look at something like apply gravity. So apply gravity, and gravity obviously only operates in the y dimension, not in the x dimension. So what it does is it takes whatever force there was before and subtracts off the gravitational constant times the mass. So what's really cool about this model in some ways in the particle approach is that literally you're almost taking Newton's equations, right, and writing them down and putting them into the computational model. So you're getting a simulation of what's going on in that space, right? Um, it's very much about elementary physics being embodied in a model. Now, what's the relationship of all this to ABM? Well, in this case, this is, in fact, you know, kind of an agent-based model. Uh, but, you know, because of the fact that the points aren't really interacting and things like that, you don't really have to have it as an agent-based model, right? Like, it could just be a physical system, right, that you're describing. It could be a set of equations, for instance, right? And in fact, you know, if you go down and you say, set the max number of particles to one, right, what's interesting about the system is that you no longer get anything interesting. It doesn't look like a waterfall anymore, right? It's just a particle shooting across the screen. It's only by having kind of the agent base aspect of having these accumulations of particles that you get something that actually looks like a waterfall. And that's kind of the relationship between particle systems and agent-based models. Okay.